Hello world, Calc Programmer one here. So I was working on my PinePhone keyboard project, uh, working on the next video. And as I mentioned in the last video, it's going to be about 3D printing new keycaps for the PinePhone keyboard. So I have a Creality Ender 3 Pro printer that I bought last year uh, as an upgrade to an older uh, 3D printer I had. And it's been a really great printer and I really enjoy it. But unfortunately, it just wasn't capable of printing the fine details needed to put the to make the little stem that held the keycaps into the keyboard. Uh, the tolerance was, were just a little too tight for what I could get out of this machine, even after changing the nozzle and tweaking a whole bunch of settings and doing a lot of test prints. So I ended up looking into going to resin printing, or also called SLA printing. And resin printing allows for much finer detail um, due to the way it works, using liquid resin instead of melted plastic. And I ended up picking up this machine, which is the Creality LD002R. It's pretty much the lowest cost resin printer I could find, um, but it looked like it had decent specs, so I went ahead and bought it. And overall, I'm pretty happy with the machine itself. What I'm not happy about though, is the ecosystem surrounding it. The software ecosystem surrounding this printer in particular and a lot of other uh, low cost resin printers and even maybe resin printers in general uh, just isn't anywhere near as nice as what is available for FDM printers. And the reason for that seems to be that the major players in the slicer space, the slicer being the program that converts your model into code that the printer can use, the big players in the SLA resin printer slicer arena are very proprietary and the main ones seem to be software as a service or subscription based. So you can't even pay once and own the software to use with your machine. No, you pay $100 for a low cost budget machine, but to get the most out of it, you have to spend a recurring fee every month, which will bypass the cost of the printer within like a year of owning and using the thing, which is really ridiculous considering there's a vast open source community behind FDM printers. There are plenty of slicer programs available that are open source, free to use, and they just have all their features unlocked and you can use them with whatever printer you want. And they're very nice. Uh, on this printer, I like to use Ultimaker's Cura. And even though this isn't an Ultimaker printer, it is very well supported by Ultimaker Cura. But with this, the only programs I could find that support it are chai box which also seems to be kind of the OEM that made the firmware in this thing. Uh, and their product is chai box Pro, which costs $15.99 a month. Or they do have a free version, but in order to download the free version, you still have to make an account, which I didn't want to do. I did end up finding a download for the Linux version somewhere else, was able to install it without making an account, but it turns out the version I downloaded was too new and the files did not work with the printer. So I didn't want to go digging into updating the firmware on my brand new printer. So I ended up going to look for an alternative slicer. And what I found, was lychee slicer and so the first thing you see is that they have obviously a pro version and it's the same situation they want to charge you a monthly fee in order to get the most out of their program their program at least worked i was able to generate a sliced file in the correct format put it on the printer and get some decent prints out of it and that i liked but the thing i didn't like is that Once it does log in and get everything, and I had already set up this little test where I have my keycap on top of some supports, but then when I go to export the file to a .ctb file, which is the file you put in the printer, it comes up with advertisements. So this is really like annoying. This is really like no, I don't like this. Um, compared to how open and free and nice 
FDM is, getting bombarded with ads for 20 seconds before you can even save a file on the one slicer that actually seems to work with my printer, that's really annoying. And I am not ready to accept that. So I did end up finding a better option. So what is that better option, you ask? Well, it's Prusa Slicer. Prusa Slicer is actually one of the big open source slicers, just like Ultimaker Cura that I talked about for my Ender 3 Pro. Um, the thing is though, Prusa Slicer supports a whole bunch of FDM machines, including the Ender 3 Pro, uh, just like Ultimaker Cura does but it only supports two SLA machines, and both of those are Prusa's own design. So unfortunately, while they support basically all of the FDM printers out there that a maker community user might have, they don't support any SLA printer that anyone might have, at least the common lower cost ones. They only support the Prusa model. And the reason for that is that Unlike in FDM, where everything pretty much uses the same firmware, Marwin, and the same format, G-Code, the same flavor of G-Code, they all, all these resin printers, because they all come from different vendors and they all have their own proprietary firmware, they all use different file formats. So, unfortunately, we can take Prusa Slicer, we can tweak the profile for the Prusa SL1, to match the physical parameters of the LD002R, which would be like the display size, display resolution, orientation, uh, the Z axis height. We can configure all of those, get the bed size correct, and then we can use it to slice a file, but it's gonna output a .sl1 file, which is the file format used by Prusa's printer. But there is a solution. There's a program called UV Tools, which is kind of a translation tool for all of these different resin format files. So we can take that output from Prusa Slicer, that SL1 file. We can open it up in UV Tools, and then we can convert it to a CTB file, which is a chai to box format file, which is what the LDR002R printer uses. Um, and as long as we get all the parameters correct, it will print. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and set up. Now we're going to keep Lychee open because even though it's proprietary and we don't really want to keep using it, it does have a built-in profile for the Creality 002R. And we can edit that and we can see all of the printer specific parameters. So we've got the width and depth as they're calling it of the LCD panel, which uh, a resin printer like this uses uh, an LCD panel to cure the resin with UV light. And the resolution of that panel affects how detailed your prints can be. And then the dimensions of the panel gives you your total print area. And then the Z axis, which is how high the bed can move up and down. Um, and then the screen parameters, even though it looks like they're just the volume is the same as the display size, which I think that makes sense. And then the screen resolution and whether it's rotated or not. So those are the important parameters. So let's go ahead and open Prusa Slicer. And I haven't opened this before. Actually, I went and cleared out the configuration so I could show you the complete setup process. Uh, so it comes with different printer presets. Um, they're basically FFF is their FDM or filament based printers. These are the official Prusa ones. Uh, I don't have any of those, so we're gonna do none. And then Prusa MSLA is their resin printers. This is the SL1. It's basically the closest thing that Prusa Slicer supports to my LD002R. So we're gonna go ahead and select that one. One thing I will point out is that Prusa Slicer supports other vendors of FDM printers, including Creality, so I can go in and pick the Ender 3 Pro and use my other printer just without any custom setup. It's just built in. But unfortunately, that is the extent of the other vendors. It's only for FDM, not for SLA. So that's something I wish that Prusa could add in the future, is like being able to have presets built in for other manufacturers, even if it still involves 
converting from SL1 to other formats after the fact. Uh, it would be nice to not have to go in and set all this up by hand, but we can still make it work, so that's good. So we've got the SL1 set up. We're gonna click Finish. Then now you can see we have the SL1 print bed, which is actually pretty much the same size as the one on the 002R, but there are a lot of settings that we're gonna to have to change. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch the tab over here to printer settings, and already we can see these same parameters that we saw in Lychee. Actually, we're gonna go ahead and click on expert, and that will show us all the parameters. And then I'm going to put this off to the side so we can compare the two and now the process is just going to be copying data from this side to this side. And we need to do some tweaking on this to get the right sort of output files because I've done some experimenting with this already. So let's continue on with copying these parameters in. So what we can see is that the volume 120.96 millimeters by 68.04 millimeters is the same on the O2R as the Prusa SL1, but there's a weird quirk I found when I was doing this the first time, and that is that the X and Y are actually flipped, and I think that might be related to this rotate being set to on in Lychee. I'm not entirely sure, but we have to switch these around. So we have to switch both the resolution and the display width and height. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and cut 68.04 because it's actually the same as on the Lychee profile, but this is actually the, the truth source. So let's just copy that 68.04, but instead of putting it in Y, we're going to put it in X or width. And then we're going to do the same for 120.96, which is width on here, but on here it's actually height. Uh, I'm not really sure why that's flipped between the two programs. But when I tried to do it the other way, I was generating files that would not print. So the same is true for the LCD panel. So over here we have 2560 by 1440. Uh, that's the same as uh, on Lychee because both have the same resolution panel. But we actually need to flip these. So 1440 here and 2560 here. So the default is portrait, but in order to make it work, you have to pick landscape, which that is a little confusing because 1440 by 2560, I would call that portrait. I'm not sure why that is, um, but we'll just go with it because it works. So I'm going to go ahead and save this as Trality LB-002R. But then there's one last thing, well actually two last things we need to tweak. The first is the bed shape. So this is going to be the actual print area that shows in the plater. Uh, the plater is where you would add models before you print them, before you slice them. And while they have 118 by 66, which is slightly smaller than the LCD size that they had, the volume in Lychee is actually the exact same as the screen. So I'm inclined to use these values uh, from Lychee because that's uh, what it uses in its profile that I know works. But I do have to flip them same as before. So X goes to Y, Y goes to X. So I'm going to put 120.96 into the Y field and then I'm going to put 68.04 into the X field. And now we have, again, what I would call a portrait display, but they're calling this landscape. Um, still not sure why that is. And then the last thing is the max print height, which is called height Z axis is 160 on the 002R and 150 on the SL1. So we need to change that to 160. So all of those settings should now We'll save that again. And now we should have Prusa Slicer fully set up to be the correct dimensions and the correct resolution and the correct orientation to be able to make a file that will print on the O2R. 
So let's go ahead and look at this. That bed area looks correct for the OO2R. We're going to go ahead and try printing a keycap. So this is one of the Pinephone keycap models that I created. Uh, it doesn't have the stem with it, it's just the top of the keycap for now. Um, and I'm going to rotate it at a minus 45 degree angle. Because in my experiments I determined that's the best printing angle because it puts the face of the keycap facing downwards away from the print, which is the surface that comes out cleanest. And then we will need to put supports under it, but Prusa Slicer will automatically do that for you whenever you slice. So we'll just leave it at supports everywhere, pad below object. We'll click slice now. It's added in four little supports, which I have printed it in this configuration already, and it does work. So we'll just go ahead and leave that alone. And then we'll click export. And this is going to produce that .sl1 file that's really tailored for a Prusa printer, which we will then have to convert. So we'll just save it. And because I already have done this experiment a few times, uh, we're going to just replace the existing one with this new file that I've just produced. So the next step is to open UV tools. Now, unfortunately, uh, I installed UV tools and Prusa Slicer using the Arch user repository on Arch Linux. Prusa Slicer works just fine. UV tools doesn't have an icon in the system menu. It doesn't have an application entry. So we will have to open it with terminal. So we'll just do UV tools and run that. And then it opens just fine. Unfortunately, you might not be able to see uh, UV tools very well on camera. Uh, it doesn't seem to scale to 4K very well. I have everything set to 200% scaling, and it looks like UV tools doesn't handle that properly on a 4K screen. So I'll just try to explain what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna go File Open, and then I can go to where I exported the SL1 file uh, that I just created with Prusa Slicer. We'll open that. And as you can see, it's showing this blob, which is, that's actually this base that it generated under the model. Uh, so it's actually showing you this first layer. And, and in Prusa Slicer, you can actually see how it cuts the model down uh, into slices. And we can see the same thing in UV tools. If I zoom all the way out, this is basically the entire printer LCD. So this model isn't very big. It's just a little model in the center. And we can take this slider here. This is showing layer zero, so the very bottom layer. And then we can just drag it up and we can see layer by layer the whole print. So that being able to look through all that means this file is good. And then we're just going to double check display pixels x 1440, display pixels y 2560, and display orientation landscape. So I actually opened one of the files I made that did print successfully from Lychee Slicer. I opened it in UV tools and double checked these parameters. Um, and I've made sure that the SL1 that I've made here converts properly to CTB with those same parameters as Lychee so that the file is going to be compatible with this printer. And that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to do file, and we'll do convert to chai to box, and then we'll go over to chai to box CTB. We'll click that. Uh, that's the format that this printer uses, is .ctb. It, now it says version selector. So it says the file format CTB contains multiple available versions. And so when I originally ran the actual chai to box program, I had a version that was too new, produced files that didn't work on my printer. Uh, my assumption is that it was using version 4. Uh, there's version 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, the files that I had opened from Lychee in UV Tools, they were version 2. So I'm also going to export this as version 2, just because I know version 2 is safe to use on this printer, that it works. So I'll click Select V2, 
I'm going to go put it in the same location and then we're going to go ahead and open it in a new window just to verify it. So we should be able to go through all the layers and see the exact same pattern that we saw in the SL1 file, which we do. So that means it converted successfully. And over here we see uh, resolution X is 1440, resolution Y is 2560. Those lined up with the lychee files that I had opened in UV tools. So we know that this file is good. So the next step would be to get our USB flash drive from our printer, go ahead and copy this CTB file to the flash drive and we can put it in the printer and start a print. So now I'm going to actually run the print. So I've put the files on the USB flash drive, the CTB file. So we're gonna go ahead and pop it in the printer, turn the printer on. So I'm going to go ahead and go to print. And I can see I've got several models on this flash drive. Here's the one we just created, which is the keycap. And as you'll notice, it's, uh, the model is in orange and the background is gray, like a dark gray. But here's a model that I made using lychee slicer. And it might be too washed out for the camera, but the background is white and the model is in light gray. So you can tell that these were made using different programs. Uh, so this is definitely made using Prusa Slicer. So it looks like our conversion went successfully because we are able to view it. And now if it lets us print it, then everything is went perfectly. So we'll go ahead and click print. And if everything goes well, it starts running. And as you can see, the printer is lowering the platform down to the resin which means it's working i did on some of the earlier prints that didn't work i got some error about projector having the wrong resolution and that's why i figured out i needed to rotate everything flip the x and y uh, but now with this configuration it seems to be working perfectly so uh, while that goes I actually have three sample prints that I've already done. Uh, and I'll go ahead and show those. Let's see if I can. So, one of these was done with lychee slicer, and the other two were done with Prusa slicer. This one in the back. was done with lychee slicer and when it added supports it added some extra supports onto the back and those extra supports seem to have caused some issues with the back of the print because they didn't snap away quite cleanly and they left all these little little bumps but the ones that printed without those supports from prusa came out really nice they only had four little supports along the bottom and they actually came out really nice now the top side, you really can't tell much of a difference. Um, yeah, you really can't tell much of a difference. So that is um, the prints that I got. And you can see on the screen here that, well, it had something on the screen that was showing that it was actually exposing. But yeah, as you can see, now it's exposing again for the second layer. But anyways, it is working and it's been sliced using all open source software. We didn't have to deal with the proprietary stuff. And so I think this is the way I want to go ahead and use this printer going forward because I prefer using open source and obviously I don't want to deal with ads or the spyware of being tracked by, you know, having to register an account and log in anytime you want to use it. Who knows where those programs are sending your information off to. Uh, I would much prefer to just use open source software that I don't have to pay extra for. 
to get the full functionality of my machine. And Prusa Slicer does that. So if you have a resin printer and you're frustrated by the different slicer options available, you can go ahead and try Prusa Slicer for yourself. You'll have to make the same tweaks that I did for your particular printer, and then you'll have to convert the output files accordingly. But I think it's worth doing, and so far the print results have turned out just fine. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with this setup, and uh, now with this setup, I'll, I'll think I'll be better going forward with the Pinephone keyboard project. So yeah, uh, thanks for watching this video, and I hope to see you on the next video, where it should hopefully be the actual Pinephone keyboard follow-up video.